we hear a word from the Lord, we want to be drawn nearer to him. It's through understanding his will and his way for us is how we truly know who he is as our God and we as his people. So we ask that you re remember that cross where Jesus died for you and he died for me so that we could have life and have it so abundantly. But that's not where the story ends. Because here we find ourselves the third Sunday after Easter, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is where our story grows deeper and unfolds. Our charge, our charge, is to know that story. Our charge is to live that story. Our charge is to tell the world about that story. There is no greater love than for a man to lay down his life for friend. And he called us friends. So my prayer and my hope is that you carry forth that Easter joy 365 days of the year. Amen. It's bigger than Easter eggs. It's bigger than chocolate bunnies. It is a life. It is a life worth living day in and day out, regardless of your circumstance regardless of your loneliness, regardless of depression, regardless of illness, it is one that should be praised and give thanks. So for our focus today, we're going to focus on the five E's of an excellent God, because he's excellent. He's excellent. In today's text from the Gospel of Luke after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and before his ascension to the right hand of the Father, the resurrected Christ walked among us on earth. He was first seen, he was mistaken as the gardener at the tomb where the stone had been rolled away. Jesus Christ spoke to Mary Magdalene, and he told her to go tell the disciples. Jesus Christ had done what he said that he would do. He had fulfilled the scriptures. So Jesus Christ was walking the earth. It's proof that his body was not stolen but that he rose from the dead just like he said that he would do. Remember, Jesus predicted his death three times, which was written in the gospel according to Matthew. We know that the 24th chapter of Luke, the resurrected Christ breaks bread with those grieving men at Emmaus turning their tears and their confusion into hope and purpose. Later that day, the Christ appeared to his 11 disciples who were gathered together. But when the glorified Jesus Christ appeared, fear was not a part of Jesus' equation. But the, but the disciples' reaction was a fear, was a disbelief. They were terrified. You see, the first E is an encounter with Jesus Christ. When Jesus appears to his disciples, he says, peace to you. What a greeting to behold from the one who endured the bitter cup on behalf of the souls of you and me. 
the one who was betrayed, humiliated, beaten, and crucified on Calvary's old rugged cross, where he hung, where he bled, and where he died. Then they laid his body in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, early in the morning, he rose from the dead. Aren't you happy? Jesus Christ meets with his disciples during this encounter to move to the next E, which he explained his reason and why he was here. You see, the resurrected Christ said to his disciples, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Being the gracious God that he is, he took time to explain that he was not a figment of their imagination, nor was he a ghost. You see, Jesus Christ said to him, behold my hands, my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that he has. During Jesus' time here on earth, he explained to us why he was here. He explained to us that he came, what he came to do while he was here. He showed us the way as he was baptized, as he fasted and prayed, as he fulfilled his ministry of healing, teaching, and preaching to all that would hear. He explained to us how to pray. He explained the scriptures, the word of God. He explained to us how to share with the feeding of the 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread. He explained to us how to imitate him. You see, Jesus presented two forms of evidence by showing his hands and feet and asking him to touch him because he wasn't a spirit. Because a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone. Secondly, Jesus asked for food to satisfy his need for physical nourishment. You see, the third E is eat. And we all love to eat. The disciples gave Jesus a broiled fish and honeycomb. Sweet honey. The resurrected Christ shared a meal with his inner circle. And let us recall these events with the meals. The resurrected Christ broke bread and gave those grieving men in Emmaus, turning their tears and confusion and grief into hope and into promise. Then Jesus shares the meal of the broiled fish with his disciples in Jerusalem. With a similar impact, fundamentally to our Christian faith and remembrance of Jesus is that wonderful meal Jesus provided to his disciples in the upper room on the night that he was betrayed and hand it over to his enemies. Jesus took the Passover bread. He blessed it in a special way. Then he broke the bread, and then he shared it with his disciples. Then he identified himself with the bread as this is his body. And then he shared the cup, the cup of the new covenant, his blood. This great act is not only a defining memory for us, but it is the way we personally experience the risen Christ in the bread and in the wine, the sacrament of Holy Communion. So you see, we are not in need of advanced degrees in theology to see the connection between the meal and the upper room. The meal shared on the road to Emmaus 
and Jesus sharing the fish with his disciples, these are moments that overcome fear and doubt. Do you have fear and doubt at times? Giving us hope and the confidence. Moments that allow us to say in confidence, he lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives today in you and in me. We had an encounter. He explained himself that he is real and that he ate physical food as well as given us spiritual food. Now we move into the fourth E, enlightenment. Don't you want to be enlightened? You see, Jesus Christ enlightened his disciples. It said that he opened their understanding, that they might comprehend the scriptures. He opened us to his word and to his will and to his way. Jesus said, it is written, and thus it is necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. That means if Christ suffered and rise, we are going to suffer as well in this earthly life. The promise is, is that you will not be alone, for he is with us. Harvey happened, and we're going through, but he is with us. Even in devastation and disaster, we were able to see the breath and the life of God through the blessings of moving in his people to lend a helping hand Amen. to neighbor. Friends. But when they saw him, they worshiped him. And this is in Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. So that lets us know that in this life we're going to have doubt. But that is when you need to pray. Because when you pray, everything changes. Not some things. Everything changes. And when we pray collectively and for each other, that's when we see the movement of God. Because when one is weak, the other is strong. That is why we are to pray without ceasing. Because without faith, how can we please him? And Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of men. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. And when you hear a command, there's no debate. You just do it. And when you fall short, you dust yourself off. And you get up and you try again. Every moment is an opportunity for a do-over and a makeover. You don't have to wait for January the 1st. If you have breath, if you have life, you have the ability to adjust and to change right now. Because he says, lo, I am with you. Always, even to the end of the age. I don't know about you, but sometimes you can call someone and no one answers. You can go and knock on the door and you know they in there. 
but no one answers. Then you can get someone tell your story and you say, I'm telling you in confidence, but before you get to your home, <laughs> someone's already asking you about it. But lo, I am with you until the end of the age. That's profound. He will never leave you or forsake you, even when you fall short. I can only imagine how he feels when he looks down upon his greatest creation and we still haven't gotten it right. I know how I feel when I talk to my children and I ask them to do X and they do Y. And then ask you for help. And you're supposed to be responding graciously. I know how that makes me feel. But I can only imagine how it makes God feel when he looks down upon this earth, seven continents, all the oceans, all the people, all the nations, and he sees what's going on right now. Right now we have the opportunity to worship him. Even though we're going through restoration in the church, it's safe. Yes. But somewhere in the world right now, it doesn't look like this. It's rubble. It's broken families. It's a orphan children, widows, devastation. So whatever we're going through, we know that we can make because he is with us. So we have to encounter the resurrected Christ. He has explained that he is real. His resurrection was real. And that he opened our hearts and our minds to comprehend the scriptures. He, we know that he will feed us spiritually as well as physically. And we know that he has enlightened us through his written word. But you know, to every good thing, one has to know how to exit. So the finally is exit. Once Jesus Christ finished everything that he had to accomplish here on earth, after the scriptures, the law of Moses, the Psalms, everything that the Bible said that the Messiah was going to do, he did. He even walked among us on this earth after his resurrection. See, he knew how to complete something. He knew how to put a period at the end of that sentence. And when it was finished, Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the time or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria until the end of the earth. We find that in Acts 1, verse 7 through 8. And at the last scripture in Luke 24, verse 48, and you are witnesses of these things. You are witnesses of these things. When Jesus had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. He ascended into the right hand of the Father. We say that in our affirmation of faith every week. And I too, when I exit, want to be with my Father. Amen. 
Church, we must believe in the word of God so that we can grow in our faith and grow closer to the one we love and be his disciples in spreading the good news of the gospel. You see, he commissioned us to be his change agent to all those that do not know him in the pardon of their sin. He wants everybody to be ready. He wants everybody to be willing because he knows that you are able. His desire for us is to have peace in our lives, to love, and have to have love in our hearts and to love each other. He wants us to have love for his church. You see, God is willing to open up a window and pour out blessings upon us. And we at faith are witnesses to it. It's right before you. Because I remember the early conversations after Harvey, we were wondering how. And now we see. So see, we too are the recipients of the meal. We're living it. If we truly love one another as we love ourselves, then know that God gives us a second chance. He gives us as many chances as we Need. If we wake up every morning, we've been given another chance. Amen. But yet, let someone cross us one time. Uh-huh. How can you expect a God that you don't see uh-huh. to bless you when you can't forgive one that you see? Amen. It's the same forgiveness. Uh-huh. Church, we are the disciples of the gospel. We must be, remember it's about the perfect will of God, not our will, not our wants, not our desires. He has a plan and a vision for each of us individually, but he has a bigger plan for us collectively as a church. Once we are in one accord, one body, we will impact our community. We will be the age, uh, the change agent that he has called us to be. When we truly embrace God's mission and the blessings that we are hoping and praying for, it will be our reality just like this sanctuary is now. But remember the five E's. Encounter. Grow in faith. You must encounter with the resurrected Christ. You have to do it on an individual basis before you can function collectively as a body. Follow the word of God because God explains his every expectation. He expects from his people called by his name because remember he opened our understanding for us and comp- to comprehend his scripture. Eat as often as you can and do this in the remembrance of me. When he gives you the spiritual food, he also gives you the fellowship. He gives us an opportunity every day, three times a day, to share a meal and share the word. Read the Holy Scriptures until the words of God are burned in your heart. That's when you're enlightened. And remember, we are ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We were made from dust, and so we will return back to our creator. So we, too, will have an exit. But by and by, when the morning comes, when all the saints of God are traveling home, we will tell the story, how we've overcome. And we'll understand it better by and by. These are the five E's of an excellent God. He makes no mistake. 
You are his heart, the apple of his eye, and you're the pulse of his heart. God doesn't make mistakes with his greatest creation. We need to be what he has called us to be. So hold on to the five E's and know that he will never, he will never forsake you and he will never fail you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.